Hi everyone, uh, this is module 9 and in this one we are talking about hazards from space and the potential for apocalypse coming from above and uh, I wore my alien t-shirt just for this occasion. Well, not just for this occasion, I wear it all the time, but I thought it was apropos for this lecture, so I'm putting it on here. Um, <clears throat> we're basically going to look at four major points uh, here in this uh, video lecture. Of course, there's the other videos that we're going to be watching, the full-length movie of They Live, as well as some other short videos that talk about things like coronal mass ejections, gamma ray bursts, and so on. But the four main points I'm going to hit in this lecture is, one is going to be about mass extinctions in general, and the role that impacts from celestial objects uh, has had on those mass extinctions, as well as talk a little bit about um, coronal mass ejections, gamma ray bursts, and of course, aliens. All right, so the first thing to really consider here is that, you know, the, the solar system as we know it has been a bit, has been a place that has very much been affected over uh, its, its course of its existence by collisions and explosions. About five billion years ago, you had a supernova explosion and the material from that supernova is what um, allowed the, the sun and the current planets to form out of that. And after the formation of the, of, of the sun and the other um, you know, uh, particles being trapped in rings around the sun, it was through a, 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 um, a continual process of collisions that you get the planets created. And so the Earth was hit by objects throughout its formation, um, and it still continues today just at a much lesser uh, rate. Um, and so one of the things is that when we're talking about some of these mass extinctions that have happened because of um, collisions and, and other uh, kinds of mass extinctions, you just have to get kind of a little bit of a view of, of geologic time, which is, you know, this comes out of the reading. And you can see that people have been around pretty much around here, right, a, the Holocene particularly, but that all of the Earth's history goes back quite a ways before that, as you can see the different millions of years ago and the different eras, and you can see dinosaurs here and all of that kind of going back into time. And so when we look at the time frames on which we talk about mass extinctions, uh, there, you know, we're talking about over courses of millions of years, there's been several different mass extinctions. And what we mean by mass extinctions is that there are time periods in the Earth's history where there's a sudden loss of large numbers of plants and animals um, and that when this happens, we kind of have these as these boundaries between different geologic periods. And there are usually, one of the main things that causes uh, mass extinctions is typically a change to the climate. But the reason why the climate changes is kind of different in different uh, um, scenarios. One is just plate tectonics, right? The slow movement of the plates, where the continents are versus where the oceans are, can have a, a large effect on the overall on the planet um, and its climate. Volcanic activity can also have a big impact. Um, there are some really large volcanic eruptions that put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, which have caused periods of warming. And then you also have at large ash eruptions, which actually have caused global cooling and also the inability of, uh, of for large areas of the planet to be able to have photosynthesis occur. And then you also get um, impacts from extraterrestrial objects. And so if we look at some of the major mass extinctions um, over different time periods, we have the Pleistocene Epoch, which was initiated by some sort of airburst or large uh, meteor hit. Um, one of the more well-known ones is the KT boundary, the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, which about 65 million years ago was created by an asteroid impact. I'll talk a little bit about that. But then you also have other boundaries, which is believed to be um, uh, mass extinction caused by the breakup of, of a supercontinent. And before that, we have volcanoes and other types of uh, glaciation going on. And also, uh, the, one of the older uh, mass extinctions is believed that the Ice Age may have actually been brought about, as you'll see in one of the videos, by a gamma ray burst um, in somewhere in the celestial neighborhood. So if we look at this graph here, it kind of shows uh, these, large these time periods where large numbers of the Earth's uh, life forms and species kind of die out. Um, and you can see that some of these are a little bit more damaging than others, but this one here between Permian and Triassic being one of the larger um, mass die-offs um, that have occurred over time. Um, one of the more well-known ones is the mass extinction at the KT boundary, where about 70% of all genera died, genera being kind of like 
you know, like genera and uh, species is like, for instance, Homo sapiens. Homo is our, our genera, right? So it's that kind of classification of life forms. And about 70% of those different types of life forms died. And because of this mass extinction, it actually allowed for the development and the evolution of mammals. And so without this mass extinction, chances are we would not be here, certainly not in the kind of form that we are today. But one of the things that uh, kind of researchers weren't sure exactly what had caused this mass extinction, but researchers started noticing that uh, at the same time as this mass extinction, there was this particular clay layer that people were finding in the geologic strata um, you know, all around the world. And they uh, kind of started figuring out that probably that this was caused by some sort of large asteroid strike. However, they weren't able to find the crater that would have uh, kind of caused this. But later in 1990s, um, they discovered that this crater didn't, uh, was discovered in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And so um, one of the things that they found is that this is essentially where that uh, crater was, uh, where that object hit. And that was what was responsible for this mass extinction event. So the asteroid's moving at about 30 kilometers per second hits the Earth, produces this really large crater, also this shock wave and heat that comes out from it sort of catches everything on fire. And then after the impact, not only do you have the fires and the heat, you also have ejecta, like the stuff that is being knocked out of the crater, up into the atmosphere. The fireball sets off wildfires around the globe. Sulfuric acid gets into the atmosphere. The dust blocks the sunlight. You also have tsunamis from this impact that reach over a thousand feet and go out in every direction. And then uh, the months and years later, you get no sunlight, no photosynthesis because of so much ejecta being brought up into the atmosphere, which causes the food chain to stop. Um, and you also get acid rain as one of the uh, effects of this too. And so um, when this happened for the KT um, extinction, you know, this of course causes these mass extinctions. Um, however, impacts of this size are fairly rare. It's estimated about once every 40 to 100 million years. But there are smaller impacts that have happened since then and are more likely to occur. Um, in terms of getting hit today, we kind of break down the different types of celestial objects into these different categories. And so we talk about asteroids, meteoroids, meteors, meteorites, and comets. And asteroids are found mostly in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but they also have some that, have, that are kind of out of that orbit. Meteoroids are basically a word that we use for broken up asteroids. They're smaller. Meteors are meteoroids that have entered the Earth's atmosphere, right? And they burn up and they cause that, you know, look like a shooting star. If it hits the Earth, we call it a meteorite. And a comet is different in that comets, uh, you know, are a mixture of, uh, have ice and other kinds of material, um, which makes them have a long tail as they get closer to the sun. And have a different origin point. They don't come from the asteroid belt. They come from the Kuiper belt, which is out past like Pluto. Uh, in terms of some famous impacts, um, usually when they come in, they come in at very large, you know, you know, you know, they come in at very high speeds. Um, and then if it strikes the Earth, um, you know, you end up with this meteorite most of the time. However, sometimes you get what's called an airburst where the object explodes in the atmosphere. Uh, and this happened actually in uh, the early 1900s over Russia. Um, <clears throat> and so this is just a diagram showing like it's a meteoroid up here. When it starts burning up, it's a meteor. It could be an airburst or a meteorite that actually hits. And if you actually look at where there are into extraterrestrial impact craters that have been verified in North America, you can see that they're all over the place. But one of the things about uh, the Earth is that we don't notice our impact craters very much because A, our atmosphere burns up a lot of the meteors, um, and two, because we have all these geologic processes on the Earth like erosion, and we also have vegetation on top of these things that fairly, uh, you know, in terms of geologic time, our craters kind of dissipate and are difficult to see or get obliterated entirely, whereas on places like the moon that doesn't have an atmosphere or any kind of tectonic um, you know, geologic vol volcanic activity, those meteor impacts craters still stay very fresh and you can see them for billions of years as opposed to the ones on Earth. Um, and then one of the reasons we know that these particular craters are meteor craters and not caused by something like volcanoes or that sort of thing is they have a pretty uh, obvious type of uh, geologic structure where you have, you know, cracking and deformation underneath, but you also get what's called breccia here, which is basically rock that's been under incredible pressure and temperature and really shocked 
um, and melted. And so um, you, can, you can tell kind of what happened to the geologic strata around it, and then you have this very shocked um, and, and pressurized uh, breccia that's, that's in the middle of the crater. All right, and as I mentioned, the reason why we don't have as many of them here on Earth is in some places like the Moon. And this just kind of talks about some of the notable impacts that have gone on um, and how long ago, oh, years before 1950, I was going to say it wasn't 42 years ago for Tunguska, but okay, I don't know why they used 1950 as their, as their baseline, but that's what they did. Um, but you can see there's some different ones here. One of the more famous ones, Behringer Crater in Arizona, which you can actually go to and visit. But you can see some of the other major impact craters there. And then we actually have a hazard scale called the Torino Impact Hazard Scale, which is um, assigned to celestial objects if we believe that it may come into potential, uh, it might potentially hit the Earth. So you can see low collision hazard passed near the Earth, somewhat close. And then we have like collision will occur with object capable of localized destruction or a tsunami every 50 to 100 years. Collision will occur with an object capable of regional devastation, etc. So we have this kind of scale. You can see these are like no hazard, uh, threatening certain collisions, and then like based on how big they are and their trajectories. So in terms of uh, what we are doing to minimize the threat of impacts, some of the videos get into this where they talk about the near-Earth asteroid tracking projects and Space Watch and that sort of thing, where they're tracking these different meteors that might potentially uh, cross paths with the Earth. And there are tens of thousands of these objects that are being tracked. It says most objects threatening Earth will not collide for several thousands of years from discovery. And of course, if we do find something that might hit the Earth, there are a few different options. We could blow it up in space. Of course, that could be, let's say, with nuclear weapons. But then the small pieces could become radioactive and rain down on Earth, so that's one issue. You could uh, nudge it out of Earth's orbit by, you know, some sort of explosion, uh, doing it just not so much to blow it up, but to knock it off course just slightly. Um, and that's one option, but you can also just evacuate if you could predict the impact point, which sometimes is difficult. And one thing you'll see in one of the other videos is sometimes we don't necessarily see these things coming. There was one time when there was an asteroid that we knew was going to be a near miss to the Earth, and so many astronomers were watching that they didn't realize that there was one coming from the sun, the direction of the sun, that we didn't know was coming and then exploded over Siberia, and this was just a few years back. So uh, some of the videos you're going to watch here, you're going to see one on asteroid impacts, about 25 minutes worth of that. Um, but there are also other ways to die um, in space, or from things that come from space. And one of the more fun ones is gamma ray bursts, and there's a couple videos that talk about this, but essentially this has to do with an exploding star that explodes in a particular way that it focuses that energy off in one direction. And if it's anywhere close to uh, our solar system, a gamma ray burst would have drastic effects, could even strip off our atmosphere, um, and then essentially cause people to bake and radiate um, from the loss of the uh, ozone layer and other things in a fairly short period of time. And as you'll see from one of the videos, it's even believed that gamma ray bursts might have been responsible for one of the uh, previous mass extinctions. One of the other dangers that comes from space is what are called coronal mass ejections. Um, and coronal mass ejections have to do with flares that are set off by the sun. And sometimes these flares send out not just uh, kind of energy, but actual material, mass from the sun, is ejected out. And if that hits the Earth's magnetic field, it causes really uh, dramatic um, changes to the Earth's magnetic field, and it can uh, basically, to make a long story short, it can short out uh, everything we have that's electronic. And so um, a, what was called a Carrington, what was called the Carrington event happened in 1859, which was a large uh, coronal mass ejection, which uh, th back in the day, there wasn't that many electrical technologies, but there was like telegraphs and that sort of thing, and it really wrecked havoc on the telegraph system. And if we were hit by a Carrington event today, we would lose so many of our transformers and electrical uh, production capacity and our computers and, you know, everything that relies on, electri on electricity, that it could uh, be a substantial um, event um, that could really uh, change the, the uh, certainly devastate the economies and, and the, way our, our, the way we function on this planet. And it would be something that would take years and years to recover from. Um, and one of the videos that uh, you'll watch for this section talks about the fact that uh, we actually had a near miss just a few years ago of another CME. So again, a couple of videos there. 
And then, of course, there are aliens. Um, and aliens are a little bit interesting in that Obviously, we don't have, you know, any firm proof that aliens have visited the Earth, and there's something called the Fermi Paradox, and there's a couple of videos for that that talk a little bit about, well, why is it that we haven't found any aliens or found, you know, definitive evidence of alien life anywhere in the universe? Because it seems a little unusual given how many planets are out there. Um, and so uh, those videos kind of get into that. But one of the things about aliens is not so much talking about them as sort of real or really existing, the bigger issue with aliens, you know, for the purposes of this class, is that they tend to uh, have some of the same functions as zombies, right? They're mad, they're, they're uh, what do you call it, fictional creatures or mythical creatures, and there's certain reasons why the movies with aliens are so, you know, popular and they serve certain functions. For one, aliens, when, you know, originally in science fiction, aliens served as a metaphor, essentially, for colonialism or cross-cultural contact. It was this idea of trying to imagine what it might look like if all of a sudden, you know, the people on the earth that were typically kind of in control of everything, all of a sudden were confronted by these people that were much more powerful and, uh, you know, were, were, you know, essentially dominating us. Like, what would that experience be like? And some of the early science fiction writers were quite explicit about this, that they wanted to have a way to talk to people in Europe or in the United States about the consequences of colonialism, but the way to make that sort of palpable, just like kind of with zombies, is that you make it mythical in a sense. It's not like country A colonizing country B, it's what if people from Mars came down and colonized us, what would that look like, how would we react, etc. Um, and one of the things that always kind of comes up in these things, which is I think fairly interesting, is this idea of interspecies communication. Uh, you know, in most of these science fiction movies, um, one of the things that comes up is the idea that, you know, aliens either, either Magically, somehow we can communicate with them, which is pretty amazing considering we can't even communicate with, say, dolphins, elephants, or anything else that shares a lot of our genetic sequences here on Earth. But, or the other thing, too, is, is that, you know, in terms of this going back to the ideas of colonialism and contact, is that sometimes when you have two groups of, of individuals that can't communicate with each other, basically you have to kind of communicate through violence, essentially. And there's all these examples from kind of colonial encounters where that's kind of how this worked, is that when people couldn't understand each other's language, it would just became this thing of like, people would kind of do something and then somebody else might respond with violence, kind of trying to get them not to do that and vice versa. And sometimes these alien movies sort of play that out too. That's the only real acceptable way to really, or available way to communicate is sort of through this, uh, you know, this violence. And of course it also just plays into the fact that it's one of the things that makes the movies interesting is when there's actual battles and things like that. But the other thing, too, just like with zombie movies, is that alien attacks try to also, or, you know, stories about aliens try to tell us about what is it that, uh, you know, how would we react in that kind of situation. And also one of the things that's a major theme in alien movies and, and stories is that that is sort of, that having to confront aliens is what gets us to heal our internal divides between other humans and kind of all come together when there's this larger threat to all of us. That's a pretty prominent theme if you see things like Independence Day, etc. Like the only thing that kind of brings the nations of the world together is that we all try and fight these aliens that are trying to kill us all. And so some of the earlier alien uh, movies, kind of where this stuff comes from, is, uh, you know, movies, old movies like uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where, you know, these aliens come down and also take over people, kind of similar to early zombie uh, metaphors. And one of the movies that, the, that we're going to watch for this section is a very campy, I admit it, it's campy, 80s movie called They Live, which is this idea that aliens have come down to Earth and they're really the people that are controlling everything and they're kind of in disguise and essentially they're sort of exploiting everybody. And there's all sorts of metaphors here for, you know, thinking about colonialism and exploitation and all of that in it. But it also has the longest fight scene in an alley that gets to a ridiculous level that you'll ever see. You'll see. And then the other thing, too, is the idea that, uh, you know, if you watch the five-minute uh, YouTube explanation by the director of the movie about just exactly what it is that his movie They Live is kind of supposed to be about. Um, but you'll see that. All right, so that's it for this video lecture. Um, just make sure you watch those other videos and answer the questions on the um, discussion.